Um, a lot focused on the back end of the fuel cycle, so I think it's good that the next presentation from Amparo is on radioactive waste management and decommissioning. <laughs> so, thank you, Sean. So, first of all, I would like to show you the reference of the report on reprocessed uranium we mentioned. So, if you Google EIA reprocessed uranium, you can find this nuclear energy series. But you can type the references number NFT 4.4, and this is the report. So, so this is my second talk, and I would like to mention that uh, it's not in my section. So there is another section dedicated to waste technology and the commissioning, and I've been asked by our director to give this talk. So the first part, it's on radioactive, it's, so the, the talk is divided in two parts. One is dedicated to radioactive waste management, and the second part to the commissioning. The first part uh, is courtesy of the section head of the waste technology section that provide me with the information. And I try to do my best to, to give you the talk and also to answer the questions. And if not, I will address the questions to him. And then I'm sure he will answer properly. So the content of the talk uh, is, first of all, what means radioactive waste, the definition, the different um, sources of generation of the radioactive waste, the classification of the waste, and the different stages uh, uh, during the process of managing the radioactive waste the waste acceptance criteria, and I will mention some of the international convention, conventions in place so far. So we have a glossary of a safety terminology. And in this glossary, you can find it in internet if you Google uh, IAEA safety glossary. And it was, uh, oh. Thank you. Let me need to read. Okay. It's okay. And it was issued issue, issue, in 2016. It was the last uh, revision. So there is mentioned that the waste is any material for which no further use is foreseen. So in the case of radioactive waste, is uh, a waste that contains or is contaminated because it's different. When it contains is because it's activated and the radioactivity is part of the material itself. And it, when it's contaminated, sometimes the contamination can be um, avoided. By, we can clean the material. Sometimes it's not that easy. But uh, if it's contaminated, we can decontaminate it. But if it it is part, the, the radioactivity is part of the material, we cannot decontaminate it. So the radioactive waste is any material that contains or is contaminated with radionuclides at a certain level of uh, concentration that is below the limit set by the regulatory body for which no other issues, uh, use, uses are foreseen. So there are many different types of facilities generating radioactive waste, and the waste are completely different. So it ranges from the radioisotopes used in medical treatments that are very short-lived, and the concentration are very small to only for treatments. And it ranges from then to or natural occurrence material to the spent fuel. So the varieties and the forms are huge. And also the facilities can be a small uh, laboratory dedicated to research, produce uh, or generate uh, waste. And the main generator is the operation of the nuclear power plant. So the, the range of facilities producing waste is enormous. 
So for that, the nature of the weights are um, very different, and they can we can find radioactive waste in with radionuclides in different concentrations and in physical and chemical forms. The radioactive waste can be gaseous, liquid, and solids. And uh, these differences result in a wide variety of options for managing the radioactive waste. So, um, the main, the overall objective in safety is the radioactive waste uh, should be managed in the form that uh, the risks to people and the environment are minimized. And it should be done in all countries using, using nuclear technologies. So, for example, to give you an idea of uh, the quantity of uh, radioactive waste produced by a nuclear power plant, uh, around 1,000 megawatts, generate uh, around 200, 350 um, cubic meters of low-level waste and intermediate level waste in the operation of the nuclear power plant and also generate about um, 27 tons of spent fuel and if this spent fuel undergoes to reprocessing it's generated around three cubic meters of high-level waste per year. So, as we see, the radioactive waste uh, are from different, uh, the, the different nature and from different uh, generations. So, it should be classified in order to harmonize and to compare from one facility to another facility in the same country and also between countries. So, the radioactive waste can be classified according with uh, their physical, chemical, and radiological properties. And due to the difficulties in comparison between facilities and between countries, it was decided to make an international guidelines for international classification. So, this is the current classification in place so far. And the first one was issued in 1970. And it was revised, revised, revised in 1981 and 94. And the last one was published in 2009. So the INC recommends countries to use this classification in order to harmonize and to be able to compare the, the radioactive waste produced in one country to another country. And it's very important that we will see uh, at the end of the presentation in terms of the Joint Convention on the Safety of Spent Fuel and Radioactive Waste Management. So the convention is a legal binding um, convention and it's based on the peer review between among countries on what they are managing. So the classification should be comparable. Otherwise, we don't know if we are, when we are talking about intermediate level ways, what does it mean? Or low level ways, what does it mean in one country to another country? Should mean the same in, in all countries in order to compare and to be able to talk about it. So, this is the current classification proposed by the agency and included in the document I mentioned before. So, first of all, we have the exempt waste. What does it mean? It's the waste that um, the content, the radionuclide or the radioactivity content, doesn't reach the level uh, set by the regulatory body, so can be cleared or exempt to go under regulation. <laughs> the second category is the very, and this is very important in the commissioning, for example, because in the nuclear power plant, 
if we consider everything because the nuclear power plant is a nuclear facility itself, if we consider everything and the regulatory constraint, oh, there is a huge amount of waste and there are a lot of buildings uh, that are not contaminated and never were exposed to, con to, to contamination. So they can be cleared and they can be um, apart from the regulation. So they are measured and they are the exempt waste. They are considered not contaminated and they are not undergoes to the, man the managing of the radioactive waste material. So we have another second category is the very short lived waste and is mainly those uh, material used uh, for medical purposes because the half life of the radionuclides used are very, very short, are hours or days, but not longer than that. So this activity, we can, the, this waste can be managed, only keep it in some uh, store facilities in the same in the same facility of the producer and leave it them until decay and when it decay they can be managed as conventional waste and for example some medical uh, waste produced by radio pharma are more dangerous by the bi biological risks for example the um, needles are more risked by the biological risks than the radiological. So radiological, if we can, if we leave, if we they leave the waste for months or years, they are sure that uh, the radioactivity has decayed under the limit and it's not longer a risk, and they are then treated as biological waste. So the, the third category is the very low level waste and they don't need a high level of containment or isolation and they can be disposed uh, in the surface, in the repository surface and we will see the different options. Then the fourth category is the low level waste and so they have levels above the clearance and they have limited amounts of long-lived radionuclides that usually are alpha emitters. So, for example, in the case of Spain, is the case of El Cabril. I don't know if you heard about it, talk about it. So, if our repository in the southwest of the country and is dedicated to low level and intermediate level waste, but they have a very strict, uh, um, they are very restricted in the alpha meters that can be disposed of there. So, this is the limitation because they consider them low level waste. And we have another category, the fifth category is the intermediate level waste. And so they have, they contain a certain amount of long-lived radionuclides that can be beta gamma emitters and alpha emitters. They require greater degree of containment and isolation and they are um, dispose uh, underground a few meters underground and the sixth category is the high level waste that um, consists in the spent fuel itself when it's considered as a waste in the open cycle option or the high level waste produced after reprocessing of the spent fuel after the purex process and it's mainly formed by fission products and myelactinides. And they are vitified in glasses matrix, conditioned in, gla in glasses matrix, and disposed in deep geological repository as a spent fuel. So, for example, to give an, ex uh, an example of an activity that generates low level, intermediate level, and high level waste is the reprocessing activities. So once uranium and plutonium um, is um, reprocessed and recycled products, they generate a waste. And the waste are the residues. So the residues are originated from the irradiation of the fuel at the reactor. And they are the hues and the end fittings 
of the tubes of the rods containing the, the, the fuel. And also residues are the minor actinides and the fissure products that form the high level waste stream that has to be beautified. So the hulls and the end fittings are considered intermediate level waste and they are super compacted and we will see later. And the minor actinides and fission products are liquid, high level liquid waste that has to be solidified including in a uh, or condition in a matrix glass. And there are the so-called operational waste that are generated in the operational of the in the operation of the facility. So they are low level and uh, very low level waste. And also they are intermediate waste. High level is the minor actinides and fission products. But there are, for example, some resins originated in the purification processes that uh, have to be managed uh, as radioactive waste. And I don't know if it's yeah, you can see properly, I think, yeah. So this is the conceptual classification that you can find in the, in the safety guide I mentioned. And so it and gives an idea, this is the level of activity and this is the time frame. So you see the six category are drawn in this draft. So this is the exemption waste. This is the short leaf that decay very, very fast. This is the low level waste, the inter intermediate waste, and the high level waste that never reach the, needs a lot of time to reach the, the level, the low level uh, or the exemption level. And in terms of safety, a radionuclide with a, a half-life lower than 30 years is considered short-lived. So all radionuclides with half-life higher than 30 years are considered long-lived radionuclides. So the different stages include in the management of the radioactive waste are the basic steps are drawn in the picture and it considered in the pre-treatment treatment and then it's when the wastes are segregated in uh, those who can be considered not radioactive waste anymore and conventional waste and those and the materials that can be recycling inside the nuclear cycle. And then once the waste are treated are conditioned to make them solid and difficult the radioactivity to be leached and released. And then after a period of storage, they should be disposed of or directly from conditioning, they can be disposed. They don't need, sometimes they don't need to pass through the storage. This is a very generic draw. So this is in the case of high level ways of a spent fuel, but some of the low level ways or intermediate ways can be conditioned and then directly disposed of in a suitable facility. So let's talk about uh, waste pretreatment. So the main objectives of these states in the management of the radioactive waste is to segregate the material into active and non-active, so we can exempt some of the materials. And also to separate them in different stream components, and this is very important because when the facility receives the waste or produces the waste, they are of different level of contamination or different level of activity content. So, and sometimes we can produce cross-contamination. So it's very interesting to keep all the streams separately to avoid cross-cutting contamination and to, to produce huge amount of waste. So the first principle is to produce as low volume as possible of radioactive waste. So another objective is to convert the waste into a form that it's easily to be treated and conditioned and to recover products for recycling. So if we segregate from the beginning, it's easier to recycle some of the materials that if we put everything together and then we segregate, it's 
sometimes they are contaminated and they are not easy to, to recycle after. So the, the most important part of uh, this pretreatment is the decontamination um, activities that um, the main objective is to reuse the materials, to uh, able to reuse the material and to reduce the contamination. And sometimes if the contamination can be uh, avoided, the classification of the waste can be lowered from intermediate to low level that make it easier to manage the radioactive waste. Also minimize the personal and the workers exposure and allows the product recovery. And always we have to keep in mind the benefits and the drawbacks of the contamination because sometimes we have something contaminated and in one centimeter, uh, cubic centimeter and it's very easy to manage because the volume is very low and then if we try to decontaminate it we create liters and liters of contaminated water or contaminated organic solvent sometimes it's much difficult to manage so the balance between the benefits economic and also from technical point of view should be always keep in mind and the characterization. So the characterization of the radioactive waste is very important in all stages of the management of the radioactive waste. Because first of all, we have to know what is included, which type of contamination or which type of radionuclides are contained in the waste. Also, it's important to have the inventory of the radionuclides stored or disposed in the facility. So, for example, in the case of a facility dedicated to low level, very limited to long lived radionuclides, it's necessary to know the inventory because the regulatory body never allows or the facility is not licensed for long lived radionuclides. The, the level of uh, alpha emitters should be kept under a certain level, so the characterization is very important. And it's not easy to characterize, uh, to, to characterize uh, radioactive waste because the gamma emitters can be characterized with non-destructive methods because the gamma rates uh, are difficult to stop. So with a detector, germanium detector, we can easily detect. But what's happened with the content of alpha emitters, beta gamma emitters, or pure beta emitters as strontium-19 or uh, all uh, uranium, plutonium, that not uh, that can emit gamma rays or very soft gamma rays. So they are very difficult to to characterize, and um, it's necessary to develop methodologies that, uh, using destructive methods, can allow the facilities to get the inventory and then to apply the so-called uh, correlation factors. So measuring the gamma emitters, we can calculate knowing from where the stream came, the alpha and beta content. So it's not an easy task, the characterization, and it's very important. And it's also necessary to meet and to be sure that the ways to meet the acceptance criteria. So the most common definition of the waste acceptance criteria, and it could be applied also to a spent fuel, <clears throat> sorry, are those requirements that are to be met by conditioned radioactive wastes forming packages to be accepted at an interim storage or a disposal facility. But it's not only important at the final for the interim storage or disposal facility, it's also the waste acceptance criteria are also very important in all different stages of the management. Because, for example, <clears throat> if we produce a material, um, in the case of a spent fuel, if we store it, the fuel in, or we manage the, the, the fuel in, in a certain circumstances, we have to be, and to have, we have to keep in mind why, what, what is the next step? Because sometimes decisions taken in one stage have a lot of impact in the second stage. So now the approach for radioactive waste and also for spent fuel management is to have an integrated approach to the whole management 
and then we are sure that the decisions taken in one stage doesn't have a lot of impact in the next stages of the process. This is the this is the issue. So <laughs> yeah, that's why we are working now into an integrated approach of the different stages. It's very difficult to have in mind now what will happen in sixty years. So. Oh, yeah, because, for example, in the case of radioactive waste, you know what the disposal facility, the requirements for the disposal facility are, you know. So you have to have in mind, in all the process, the acceptance criteria at the end. And for the radioactive waste, the intermediate, low level, is not that difficult because the facilities are now in place. But for spent fuel storage, for, for spent fuel disposal, for example, it's very difficult to have in mind. So now, um, we have a, a, a meeting, a big meeting. Uh, it was, um, um, was a conference in 2015. And the main message of the conference on spent fuel management was we should approach the management of spent fuel in an integrated way. Because, and the communities has to talk each other. Because the community dedicated to storage doesn't have in mind disposal issues. Even in the agency, for example, we are separated in different sections. So we are working in the storage in one section, and they are working in disposal in another section. In another section. And we have to talk each other, and we have to be aware what the needs in disposal and, and disposal have, have to have in mind what is happening in the storage so far to be able to smooth the interfaces. So there's a lot of effort applies to that because it's very difficult. So in the ideal world, we should have uh, some acceptance criteria that, of course, the technology changes. And maybe solutions in 60 years are completely different that we now we know now. But at least we should have something in mind for disposal, and it should be not known by the people working now in the storage to keep in mind that in the future the, the constraints or the needs will be this and that and that. And it's not that easy. Even, for example, for the safeguards, it's, it, it, if I explain like this, is it sounds very funny, and it's not funny. So we have a, a meeting in April in the INC with the main actors in the world on disposal and storage. And then we invite a person from safeguards. And the person from safeguards said, now we are working so ha very hard with countries, with, for example, from Sweden. And the representative from Sweden said, ah, thank you, because they designed the facility for disposal without taking into account the safeguards uh, requirements. And then the lady from safeguards said, and we need inspection here, inspection there, inspection there. And then once the walls are built, then we have to drill. Oh, no. So it sounds uh, common sense, but uh, the communities are very isolated. And a lot of effort now is applying to have in, in mind all the requirements uh, in the disposal or in the storage, but mainly in the disposal, because it will last a lot of time. So it's not that it's very difficult. And of course, it's, this is the general, the general definition. And as the wastes are more difficult to manage, the acceptance criteria are more difficult to meet at the end. 
So what are the results uh, of the pretreatment? So we will try to improve the safety, to lower the radiation exposure, and so we have to balance the effort and benefit, not to avoid generating a lot of secondary waste that sometimes are more difficult to manage than the primary waste. Treatment. So there are different operations um, in treatment that in principle are dedicated to reduce the volume and to remove, when it's possible, the activity of the waste to lower classificate them. And we have some examples of liquid tr uh, waste treatment. And as you can see, they are dedicated to reduce the volume. So after filtering or uh, evaporation, distillation, or ion change resins purification, we can have a reduced volume of waste. And we can, and in order to condition a lower volume, but uh, sometimes it's more difficult. So we have to keep in mind that sometimes the conditioning of the concentrators are more difficult than the conditioning of the waste itself. So, an important consideration to choose the treatment for the liquids are the characteristics of the waste and. The, sometimes, for example, if we separate the liquid, sorry, the liquid stream by distillation, we can have water and the concentrate, and the water we can discharge because by distillation we cannot uh, have uh, contamination in the distilled liquid. And in the case of solid waste. There are different methods based on uh, compact compactation and also melting or incineration and chemical and biochemical treatments. So, for example, in the case of compact compaction, sometimes we can compact inside the drum. This is the normal harmonized 220 liters drum. And a lot of volume of waste are produced in the operations of the gloves, the cover shoes, the clothes, the masks, and these um, waste can be compacted to increase the volume that can be placed in one drum. Or sometimes with the metal, metal parts, as we saw during the reprocessing with the hulls, for example, of the roads, we can super compact these um, ways to reduce a lot the volume. So you can see here in the picture, in the slide, the volume reduction when we compact in the tram is two, five times, and super compaction, the reduction is 10, 15 times. And then we improve the, the volume in the repository. Other option is the incineration, and it's a normal, like the conventional waste. So the organic part is transforming CO2 water, and we have at the and we get a secondary waste, the ashes, that the volume is reduced uh, dramatically. So we have a volume reduction 50, 100 times, and melting is uh, used during the commissioning, for example, some research reactors. It can the, the aluminum part of the core can be melt, and the products are separated in the result metal and also um, what it means in English, I don't remember the name, slack. The slack. So has been proved that the main radioactive content remains in the slack while the metal remains clean and can be recycled inside the nuclear cycle. What about the filter? Sorry? What about the filter? Yeah. So the off-gas, yeah. So the off-gas are treated with, um, um, with filters, with EPA filters, or also 
are some gases are trapped in <coughs> insorption beds, insertable insorption beds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Depending on the contamination, you can incinerate, for example, you can incinerate the filters. If they are made of incinerable material, you can incinerate the filters and then get the ashes and manage the ashes. But yes, of course, you have to. And uh, yeah, sometimes it depends on the size of the filters. And the humidity in the case of the filters? So I'm not a specialist in the off gas treatment, but I think there are different traps, different levels. So you, the water condensate at one, less than 100 degrees. So you can have lower condensation of water and then the EPA filters above with avoiding to have water. You know what I mean? So you have a cool tower and then the, the emanations are cooled before to get the filter that are sensitive to humidity. So you can work like this. I get so because there are different steps in the filtration path. So of course the off-gas has to be treated. And this is, for example, this is a, for the case of the reprocessing facility where you, the spent fuel is shopped and solved the main radionuclides or gases contained in the spent fuel is the iodine and the noble gases that uh, usually are inside the pellet or in the places between the pellet and the clad. And should be, these gases are treated by appropriate field sorptions, beds. So conditioning. The conditioning is, the main idea is to solidify the waste and to put the waste in the form that uh, the radioactivity will be difficult to be leached and to be released. So in the case of low level and intermediate level waste, the cement is the more used matrix. And in the case of high level waste is the glass matrix. There are different uh, packagings. So once the suitable matrix is identified, is mixed the matrix with the waste, and then is solidified and immobilized in a package. So this is a 220 liter drum, and this is, for example, concrete uh, packages for more active um, waste because concrete stop the gamma emissions. And these ISO containers are mainly used in the commissioning for uh, for um, sands, for um, big uh, volumes of radioactive waste with very low contamination. And they are put like this because um, there is design um, characterization uh, procedure with three and three detectors. So the box, can, the box, the ISO containers pass through the six detectors and in a slow speed and then is detected if the content is below the certain levels and then it's considered exempt or they are considered radioactive waste. So there is a harmonized procedure to characterize this type of containers. You mean the external corrosion or the internal corrosion? Yeah. Oh, so far, as far as I know, so far the the concrete is been proved to keep it safe because, for example, some facilities dedicated to low level um, are based on concrete as immobilized mat matrix and also as a structural containment and as the buildings. So. 
the, of course, the concrete has to meet some specific specifications and requirements to be used in the radioactive waste facility as a matrix or as a structural containment. But uh, I think, and the license, the facilities uh, are licensed, I think, by 300 years or something like this. And it uh, is proof that it's, it's licensed by its time. So it's like the buildings. Is considered a suitable material. For, for example, in the case uh, we will see later, in the case of some facilities, at least in Spain, El Cabril is based on a concrete uh, structure, um, structure as a matrix, and also uh, different cells, plenty of trams, and immobilized with concrete as a structural material. So after the conditioning, the waste has have to be stored. I think we talk about, a lot about uh, storage. And then has have to be disposed of, and this is the options. So for very low level waste, can be stored in the surface. For low level waste, uh, needs to be stored in underground, but not very deep only a few meters depth. For intermediate level waste, they need more isolation. So they have to be disposed uh, in deeper um, constructions. Uh, for high level waste or spent fuel is the deep geological repository. Sorry. Sorry, for This is missing. I think in any case, but uh, it's more important in the case of intermediate and, and high level waste. But in any case, because if you put a surface repository in a seismic area, it's not good. But it's not a risk, high risk. But in the case of intermediate or high level waste, it's, it's one of the main parameters to be taken into consideration the seismic. seismic. Thing. Oh. Mm -hmm. The same requirement. I don't know because I'm not safety specialist, so maybe you should ask somebody from safety for license. Uh, I don't know. By my common sense, say that it should be the same, but I'm not sure. But for example, in the case of the um, deep geological repository, because the nuclear power plant is licensed by 40 years of lifetime, but in the case of the deep, deep geological repository, it will last for a long time. So maybe it shouldn't be the same. Maybe it should be more restrict in this case, but I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. I think one example is the uh, LEU building, if they're opening Kazakhstan, they spent a lot of time doing the seismic studies and 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 the seismic Borhol? Yeah. Yeah, in principle, it's mainly dedicated to the source sources. Yeah. Yeah. But the source sources is a radioactive waste also. Seal source. Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, I think so far the current options are dedicated to the source sources, 
I guess, more than intermediate. But in this uh, slide, it's considered all radioactive waste, not only those coming from the nuclear power plant. Uh, so this is a graph uh, facing the different options with the different levels of classification of the radioactive waste. So we see the very low, short leaf, and very low its surface, low level, some meters below or over the ground, and the intermediate deep, and the high level waste very deep. So this is an ex example of engineered near surface disposal concepts. And for example, you can see here, this is El Cabril. And you, you can see the concrete structure. The cells are made of concrete. And the idea is to fill these cells, and I think it's the same like here, here, with drums in a square cells filled with concrete. And then these fill all these cells with concrete and cover them. And at the end, the remediation is made with vegetation at the end. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think the concrete, the formulation of the concrete to be put in as a matrix. It's um, it's disposal facility. It's disposal facility. Yeah, for low level waste, and the, the the concrete is used as a matrix to to immobilize the low level waste. And the formulation of the concrete, I think, is it, licensed to last the whole period and to avoid the leaching of the radioactivity. Yeah. And it's used as matrix. It's a conventional matrix for low-level waste. And um, and this is uh, the other option is when it's a few meters below the ground floor is the trench type disposal, and you can see different examples in the United States, in France, and in Argentina, for example, and is dedicated to low-level waste. So, so far, the low-level waste disposal is a mature and well-understood practice, and the requirements are uh, uh, you can find the requirements in this uh, safety guide. It's SSR 5, about the disposal of the radioactive waste. And um, so there are more than 100 low-level waste repositories working so far in the world. So there is a lot of lessons learned and operation experience uh, gathered. And this, um, there are different range of disposal solutions. And since there are different types of radioactive waste produced in the different um, action operations with uh, nuclear, with the applications of the nuclear energy. And this, um, this uh, experience gather are very useful for the newcomer countries, of the people, the countries we started working with the applications of nuclear energy, not only with the nuclear energy production. So the INC is always um, fostering the change, the sharing of lessons learned and the operational experiences. And this is options for the mine cavities, is when uh, the intermediate level ways are disposed of um, deeper and below the ground. And these are the examples of the different options of the geologic repository. And we talk about them during the last talk. So the option for high-level waste that we mentioned is the deep geological repository. And the most important thing is now after experiences, there is a clear recognition that the importance of the stakeholder engagement. And now there's a lot of effort put in engage and find the ways and the tools to engage this stakeholder from the beginning of the disposal facility and the decision and the siting process. 
So we talk about this. I'm not going to repeat that. And one of the most important things to minimize the waste, all the, part, the, the volume and also the radioactive uh, content. And it's made reducing the generation at source and recycling and reusing the material. And it should be made in all the stages of the nuclear energy cycle. So since the facility design through the operation and during the decommissioning of the nuclear power plant. So as I mentioned, there is a lot of effort now uh, put in the stakeholder involvement and there are a lot of activities performed by the INC and also in collaboration with another international organizations as the OECD NEA and the European Commission because it's important to build trust and confidence of the public in the nuclear industry and the nuclear applications. Because many people go to the hospital and they don't know that they are treated by nuclear material and they don't know. So I think there is a lack of communication to the public, in general public, about the benefits and what they are receiving from the nuclear applications and the nuclear industry. So let's talk about the international conventions. So since um, the countries are not working now isolated, so there is a lot of international relations and there is a directive um, issued by the uh, Euratom in the European Commission in 2011 about uh, giving a guide and advice to the countries on how to manage radioactive waste and spent fuel to harmonize the practices. And also there is a code of conduct on the safety and security of the radioactive uh, sources. And now there is the joint convention on the safety of spent fuel management and radioactive waste management. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about it. And the joint convention is a legally binding agreement between contracting parties. So the countries are free to sign the contract, but the INC is fostering and try to encourage the countries to sign the contract and to be part to the joint convention. It's the only international legally binding instrument in the area of safety and security of spent fuel and radioactive waste management, and is based on the safety fundamentals of radioactive waste management. So this is the story. In June 19, 1997, the Board of Governors authorized the DG to convene a diplomatic conference. And in September of this year, the Joint Convention was signed by 42 member states and entered into force in 2001. So every three years, there is a meeting. And the last one was in May 2015. And the next one will be in May 2018, so next year. And so far, there are 76 contracting parties at, as July 2017. So what is the objective of the Joint Convention? Is to achieve and maintain high level of safety, of safety worldwide and to ensure that there are effective defenses against potential hazards to the individuals and to the environment. So, and also the idea is to prevent accidents and mitigate their consequences. So when a can country sign as contracting party, they commit to adopt the appropriate measures to ensure the safety of spent fuel and radioactive waste management. They commit to prepare and submit a national report for the peer review of the other contracting parties. They commit to respond in written to the questions addressed and submitted by other contracting parties to attend the meetings every three years and also to commit to participate actively in the review process. So the strategy, the policies and strategy of every contracting parties are peer reviewed by the other contracting parties. So in this case, 
the agency only act as a secretariat, so we are the depository. We, sorry, we are in charge to organize the meetings, to hold the meetings, to maintain the website with the information, and also to make promotional activities to, as uh, to promote, um, to uh, and to make other countries to sign as contracting parties and for example the last two years we got six new so we were 70 contracted parties by 2015 and now we are 76 so in six, in two years we get six more contracted parties and the joint convention belongs to the countries themselves so they have to submit uh, national report that shall contain the policy and practices for spent fuel and radioactive waste management to address the criteria to categorize the radioactive waste. And they have to include the listing of facilities and the inventory of spent fuel and radioactive waste. And they have a web page you can find in this uh, link. With, uh, and they decided which um, information they would like to make public to the public or they keep uh, reserved by themselves. So I think I'm going to go quickly to the decommissioning part. So only as a conclusion, uh, if the radioactive waste are managed safely, securely and environmentally I, we would like to have more public confidence in the nuclear industry that increase the, acceptab the acceptability of the nuclear energy and the nuclear applications. So now let's move to the decommissioning part of the talk. I will I try to be as fast as I can. So this presentation is a courtesy of my colleague Vladimir Michal, who is the technical lead of decommissioning in the waste technology section and environmental remediation. So looking to the glossary, the safety glossary, nuclear decommissioning uh, is the administrative and technical actions taken to allow the removal of some or all of the regulatory controls from a facility. But not only from a facility, because there may be areas of land that have become contaminated during operation of a facility and the cleanup of these areas is also part of the decommissioning. So decommissioning activities have to be performed uh, to achieve a progressive and systematic reduction of the radiological hazard and it's undertaken on the basis of a uh, very rigorous planning and assessment to ensure the safety, protection of workers and the public and the environment as well. So, and it should be taken into consideration as a normal and expected part of the life cycle of any industrial facility. So as we will see, the decommissioning should be keep in mind from the beginning of the design of the facility because if we have to dismantle a facility and it was taken into account at the time of the, of the design, it should be easy. So this is the, situa the current situation. So there are more than 19 power reactors decommissioned so far. And there are more than 400 other facilities, including research reactors or research and development facilities, universities and nuclear fuel cycle facilities that have been shut down for decommissioning and undergoing decommissioning or have been decommissioned. So there is a lot of uh, knowledge and experience um, on the commission so far. So these are some numbers that you can get. If you type PRIS is the INC Power reactor infrastructure system, information system, thank you. 
I mean, if you can type, uh, if you type Google EIA APRIS, you can get the link. And also, we have a database on reactor and nuclear fuel cycle information system, also for nuclear fuel cycle facilities. And you can find this type of numbers of the nuclear reactors in operation, which are long -term, in temporary shutdown or uh, in permanent shutdowns, and so on. This is the outlook of the commissioning for nuclear power plants. And so it's foreseen a growing in the decommissioning uh, um, of the power reactors. And this is the scenario for the shutdown. So in 2020 something, most of the plants that were built and constructed in the 80s will reach the end of the life. So they will be shut down and they will go under the commissioning. So, as uh, it's mentioned in the general safety requirements in the part six on uh, the commissioning of facilities, you can find the, these three decommissioning strategies. One is the in immediate dismantling. It means that the commissioning actions begin shortly after the permanent shutdown and everything is uh, removed and the land is clear for other purposes. But there is another option that is a deferred dismantling and when it's considered that after shutdown the country wait or the operator wait until 40, 60 years before starting the dismantling of the facility. In this case, they use this time to allow the short-lived radionuclides to decay, and then the radioactivity to be managed is lower and the decay heat is lower. So this is the strategy that the country can choose, but in the case of the, defer, the referred dismantling, since they wait 40, 60 years, it could be a lot of changes in the requirements and in the safety and in the governments. So it's very dangerous and that cost maybe can cost um, higher cost at the end. And the third option is the so-called entoptment. And it's a combination of the two other options. So on one hand, some parts of the facilities are dismantling at the commission and another part uh, are kept in safe mode, so are, um, are conditioned in order to avoid the radioactivity <laughs> release. But um, it's this condition, this option is not considered as uh, the commissioning strategy, and it's not an option in a normal shutdown and the commissioning is only considered in the case of uh, normal circumstances as a severe accident. Or as we will see in the case of the reactors using uh, graphite, it has decided to go through this option. And I will explain later. So these are some numbers of the nuclear power plants so far. So they are around 50 that go or plans to go under deferred dismantling. There are around another 50 that plans to go under immediate dismantling. And there is these three in, in top. So the, the radioactive material has been conditioned in situ. So the land uh, has to has to be restricted access and restricted use. And there are another around 25 without any decision taken so far. So this is, for example, an, uh, this is an example of uh, one nuclear power plant under immediate dismantling. So it is the Yankee Row nuclear power plant in the United States. And it was fully decommissioned in 2007. And the shutdown was in 92. And you can see the land with the nuclear power plant, the land after with the completely commission, the commission uh, site. But the spent fuel remained 
in the site. So now it's a problem that, uh, for example, in the case of the United States, they are facing because most of the plants are reaching the, um, the end of the lifetime or they are shutting down uh, due to economical reasons. And this, the storage remain on site. And at the time the nuclear power plant is in operation, that is fully staffed, but uh, should be remain staff that uh, take care about the storage facility. So it's an issue that now countries are facing how to deal with different interim storage sprout all over the, the countries. And also in Spain, we have the same problems. We are building interim storage because we don't have any centralized interim solution. We are building interim storage in three, four of our nuclear power plants. And at the end of the lifetime, when the nuclear power plant will be the commission, the storage will remain alone there. And this is an example of deferred dismantling. So it's an example of the nuclear power plant of uh, graphite gas. This was Bandejo's one. It was shut down in 89 after an accident without any environmental consequences, but the operator decided to shut down the plant. And uh, so this was the plant. And then uh, after the, the demolition and dismantling, the graphite is kept. So the spent fuel was sent to France for uh, uh, reprocessing, but the graphite is, is very difficult to manage and was kept for a dormancy period of 25 years that will be finished in 2028. 20, 20, yes, because it was started in 24 for 25 years. Uh, to allow the, the majority of the activity to decay because the graphite, uh, the radionuclide inventory of the radiated graphite is unusual in comparison with another nuclear waste. So there's a lot of cobalt 16 that has a half life of five years. And there's a tritium, a huge amount of tritium that is one order of magnitude of the concentration of uh, carbon 40. And it's also chlorine 36, that is a long term, because it's a radionuclide, it's a beta emitter with a long half life. So now uh, there is a project run by the INC in order to harmonize and to find solutions among all countries that uh, have nuclear power plants with graphite, irradiated graphite to, um, to gather breath practices and to discuss and to find harmonized solutions among, among countries to, to manage the related graphite. So the decommissioning has to go under a very strict plan. So the successful of the decommissioning depends on the careful organized uh, plan and should be prepared for any nuclear facility. So the INC recommends to prepare the plan for the commissioning at the beginning and um, before the operational of the facility and to revise the, the plan. So in that case, the records of the, all changes that during the lifetime of the facility are made should be kept as a record and um, facilitate the decommissioning uh, tasks. And also the INC recommends when a nuclear power plant is shut down to start the operation um, taking or taking the spent fuel first um, to store on site or away from the reactor, but starting um, discharging the spent fuel from the core, the, uh, from the first uh, part. So we can keep so, the responsibilities associated with the commissioning, we have three main bodies, the government, the regulatory body, and the licensing. So, the government, the responsibility is to establish a national policy for the management of the radioactive waste, and also the waste generated during the decommissioning. They have, the government is the responsible to establish and to maintain the legal, so with the regulatory body, 
and the technical and the financial responsibilities for organizations is involved in the decommissioning. So the government is the responsible to be sure that there will be funds available at the time of the decommissioning of the nuclear power plants. And also, they are responsible to ensure that there are the necessary uh, scientific and technical expertise in the country to do the decommissioning activities. The regulatory body shall regulate all aspects of the commissioning throughout all stages of the facilities lifetime, from the initial planning and uh, during the, the commissioning. So it's the, the, responsibility, the responsible to issue the license for operation and also the license for the commissioning. And the licensing shall plan for decommissioning and shall conduct the decommissioning actions in compliance with the authorization of the commissioning issue by the regulatory body. And is the responsible for all aspects of safety, radiation protection for the workers and for the environment. So what are the decommissioning challenges? So the first one is the financial needs. So as you can see, I put some figures of the cost of the commissioning of different plants. In Spain, it's very a small plant, and also in Finland and in Slovak. And this is the forcing cost. So there is also a need for research and development and innovations in technologies for characterization and survey, for segmentation and dismantling, and the contamination and remediation of the environment. And so since um, there are different type of facilities to be dismantled, uh, the INC is, going, is organizing uh, discussion groups, to share information and to put in common all the developments that different countries are getting. So, so. Oh, it's the country estimation for the cost. I don't know what they consider, the figures they consider, or the implications in the country. Because the Lovisa is in Finland, so and they have the disposal facility available. And I don't know, I don't have the all the considerations they, they consider when they calculate the cost. This is the calculated cost by every country. But it's to give an idea that it's about 100 millions of dollars, 100 millions of euros. And I guess uh, that uh, this is the initial calculation, and the final calculation is completely different. And the final cost will be completely different. So this is the estimation cost, depending on what is considered. So but at the end, we finalized with the same as during the nuclear, the spent fuel and radioactive waste management. So it's necessary to have a effective stakeholder involvement also in the commissioning and environmental remediation activities because there is a huge amount of waste managed during these uh, activities. So, and this is very important because there is a lot of international cooperation and collaboration in this field. So as an example, the INC, the OECD, NEA, and the European Commission are working together. And for example, the OECD launched in, 2000, uh, in 1985 a program dedicated to a change scientific and technical information and they, they are still working in this project. So the phase it will start, it started in 2014 until 2018, the last phase of this project. 
And after Fukushima accident in 2013, Japan established the Ibrit project, and it's the International Research Institute for Nuclear Decommissioning. And in January, the INC, also after Fukushima accident in January 2015, established the Darot project, as is the project on decommissioning and remediation of damaged nuclear facilities under the INC nuclear safety action plan. And the project um, gathered 35 international experts from 19 member states. So you can have, you have here the links of the three web pages with, you can find the information of this international collaboration. So what is the INC doing in the decommissioning program? So we are developing technical publication and safety guides as you, you see. Uh, the network, we have an international decommissioning network. We collaborate with the technical cooperation department in projects on decommissioning to help member states. We um, held some conferences, and the last one was the international conference in Spain in May 2016. We also organized peer reviews, missions to review the national decommissioning programs. And you can find a lot of information in the decommissioning module in the PRIS um, information system. So these are some publications. And this is the conference in Madrid. And this is the link with, uh, of the proceedings. You, you can have all the information for the conference in this link. And some examples of activities related to the commissioning. We have a wiki. Yeah, under the network on the commissioning. And so the wiki can be used for a number of purposes, such as helping to select the best dismantling or the contamination methods, or identifying uh, where different decommissioning activities are taking place, opportunity for benchmarking. So you can join the network, and then you can have access to this wiki to get the information. And you can, here, you can find the links to get the access. And this is the different networks we have in the INC. So once you have the nucleus access, you can request access to the decommissioning network, also to the disposal, relative waste disposal network, or the spent fuel management network. And sorry for the time I get. And we are also developing e-learning material, and they are publicly available. Those in green are already available in the web page of the INC. It's public, but it's not that easy to find. So you need to search and search and search, and then you get the material. So it's publicly available, but it's difficult. And this is the link. So you can, there are some modules on disposal and remediation already published, and we are work, now we are working to develop a module on spent fuel management and also on the source, sources. So this is the platform where you can get the e-learning material, and it's very interesting. I recommend you to, to look this material. And that's it. Thank you for your attention.